Joe presents TKO together with 32 Red. Welcome to round 24 of TKO here on Joe together with 32 Red. We are a podcast and YouTube show with you every Thursday. Now, I've got a different sparring partner this week because Carl, as you know, is neck deep in camp in preparation for his fight in Philadelphia on the 10th of August. So I'm solo this week and we've come to Loughborough University. Now, this place is the hub of UK sport. We've got some of the top athletes in the world train here, a lot of the GB athletics team, a lot of the England cricket team, rugby players train here too. And one of the rising stars of British boxing over the last three years, heavyweight sensation Dylan White is now just a couple of days out from his WBC final eliminator against Colombian Oscar Riva live at the O2 Arena on Saturday night. We'll be catching up with the man himself, Dylan White, as he makes his final preparations ahead of his headliner at the O2. We'll also be catching up with Richard Riappor and John Harding Jr., two of the fighters that he manages that are also on the bill, uh, as well as his coach and trainer, Mark Tibbs. This is round 24 of TKO. So plenty of people have come here for the media day just a couple of days before the big fight night. Um, this is the Loughborough Martial Arts Centre. Now this used to be a gym uh, when I was a student here some seven or eight years ago. Um, it's now been turned into a purpose kind of fight facility. Um, Dylan exclusively bases himself out of here now. He lives above a, a pub um, just down the road from here, works with Mark Tibbs, his trainer, who um, used to be at West Ham ABC back in the day under the guidance of his dad, Jimmy Tibbs, who of course trained Frank Bruno and more recently Billy Joe Saunders. Um, so you've got all the fighters in the ring at the moment. You've got Charlie Duffield, uh, you've got John Harding Jr. with a white headband on, Richard Riappol, Cruiserweight, who's fighting Chris Bill and Smith uh, on Dylan's undercard at the O2. Um, and of course, Dylan himself, who's up against uh, undefeated Colombian Oscar Rivas, who's 26 uh, and Oh, that will all be live at the O2 on Saturday night. It's a great setup they've got here. As I said, this is really the kind of hub of, of UK sports. Have a little wander a little bit closer. And these kind of media days are really when the fighters get a chance to speak to the papers, the videographers, get their stories out there ahead of the, the fight, kind of sell the last batch of tickets, um, if there are any left. We'll also hopefully speak to uh, Dylan's s &C coach as well, because one of the things that's been noticeable about Dylan in the last kind of one to two years is his improvements as a physical athlete. You know, he was a rough, ready fighter, physically very, very strong. Um, but, but what has changed is the scientific approach towards his training. So at, at Loughborough, fighters and, and athletes get access to nutritionists, physiotherapists, um, massage, specialist strength and conditioning coaches. All things are programmed and their data is logged and tracked. And, and so their progress can be measured in a way that is not really possible in, in many facilities outside of this. Um, and certainly it's been evident from the way Dylan's been fighting and, and the progress he's made in boxing that this is probably quite a big part of the success he's had certainly in the last three years um, since that defeat against Anthony Joshua. It says a lot about Dylan that he's thinking not only about his own career as a boxer, he's thinking about um, life after thinking about management and, and also just bringing up his cohort, raising up other fighters by giving them opportunities that um, he worked so hard to kind of carve out for himself. So this really what you're seeing is, is a product of, of Dylan's thought, Dylan's kind of forward thinking approach. You know, it's his stable, it's, it's his tribe as you, uh, if you will. It's interesting to see already, can you see the, the variation work that Mark has clearly been Impressive on Dylan. They're varying up the pace of their shots, working on very different variations of the jab, doubling the jab up, different head positions on the, the second jab, jabbing once forward, coming back, little two phase attacks, and it's varying the, the tempo and the pace of the shots, which is what the best fighters tend to do. Nothing's ever one paced, giving fighters different looks. Varying up movement, varying pace, keeping his head off centre, centre line. As you can see there, when he jabs, dipping right, dipping left to anticipate the counter right hands that might come back from the rebounds on Saturday. Good work. So, so much improved in, in two and a half years. I was speaking to Mark earlier, and hopefully we'll speak to him shortly, but he was saying it's hard to see the improvements when you see a fighter every day. But honestly, for someone that's watched Dylan since the kind of early days of his career, he really, really has improved. He was on a, an undercard, I can remember, years ago on one of Mick Hennessy's bills at uh, the Glow Arena in Blue Water night where I think James DeGale boxed, Chris Eubank Jr. boxed as well. And he was really in his infancy then. We didn't know what uh, kind of star of the sport he'd be in his own right then. And it's a product of the daily hard work that you're getting a glimpse of 
in the gym today. I think it says quite a lot about Dylan. That at one point, he was uh, kind of an away corner opponent for Anthony Joshua, and now oh, I wouldn't say the tables have completely turned, but in his own right, he's training here in the Midlands, headlining at the O2, and we've got Coogan Cassis Ryan from TV here. We've got Matram here, you've got BBC Radio, Sky. He's become a name and a ticket seller, completely in his own right, of his own making too. See, um, Mark Tibbs has got his elbows uh, strapped up. And that is because, well, I think for very obvious reasons, you can, if, you if you're listening to the audio, you'll be able to hear the impact of the shots on the pads. But that impact really is reverberating right the way down through the arms, through the shoulders. And Mark, he's not a small guy, but he's not what you describe as a, as a big bloke. And he's got someone 18 stone every day whacking those pads, all that force going through his wrists, his elbows, his shoulders. And that over time really takes its toll. I speak to a lot of the top coaches who've had heavy handed fighters, Dave Colwell with Tony Bellew, Rob McCracken with Anthony Joshua, um, Adam Boob, David Hay, just all, all of them say the same thing. They're like your, your shoulders, your elbows really, really do take a, a pasting in the duration of a, of a camp. So he's got those straps up tight, hopefully just to minimise the impact of, uh, of what's coming back at him. So just grabbing a couple of minutes with Simon Evans, who officially is uh, one of the physios here at Loughborough. Unofficially, I know you do a lot of coordinating and a lot of other stuff that's kind of beyond your remit. Uh, how long have you been working with Dylan for? Uh, so I've been with him for around uh, about three and a half years now, since, since his Joshua fight, and this will be the 10th tenth, tenth camp. Wow. Yeah. A lot of fights since then, isn't it? And he's come a long way. Um, how much do you put that down to the facilities and things that are around him? Because I don't think many people, unless they've, they've been party to what goes on here, yeah. know just what a huge difference this kind of setup can make. Yeah, it's massive. I mean, clearly Dillian has his own natural ability anyway. Um, and that's, that got him to, to the level he was at. And then after the Joshua fight, he came here and we really introduced him to a load of things. He's a proper strength and conditioning program, his physio mm. from injury prevention, his nutrition. Um, everything is just his, his general well-being and, and really just made it far more structured and, and professional and, and with that I mean you can see the results how he's getting on in, in the ring. From a technical point of view we were talking earlier off camera you were saying about the way he was punching when he first got here yeah. versus yeah. what he's doing now we could see on the pads and hear the hear the power for people who are listening on the podcast yeah. what was that technical shortcoming what, what are you seeing now three years later? So, yeah so he's very much when he first arrived, he was very much upper body dominated. So he just he was throwing punches, but all the strength would be coming from the shoulder uh, and from the elbow. But now we're really incorporating full body functional movements. So really getting that hip drive in, getting his legs in, because they're the biggest and strongest muscles in your body. So you, if you can incorporate them into your performance, and that's only going to help you. So his kind of weights program, is that geared towards a lot of explosive movements, compound lifts and things that maybe he wasn't doing before? Yeah, absolutely. So speaking to Al, with his strength and conditioning coach, he, he had, it's, it's very much... Um, Face, so you have uh, part of it will be power, part of it will be strength, uh, part of it explosive, and, and also you've got, you've got to bear in mind the endurance element to it as well. So it's, it's the full package, and, and you've just got to take every element of the fight itself uh, and, and break it all down and really train around that. Um, so your role as physio, I imagine yes. a big part of it is kind of prehab and injury prevention, yeah. but also management of injuries when they do occur. So talk me through a, a kind of a, a, an average um, sort of week when you're in camp within the kind of things you have to manage. Yeah, so um, I have a good relationship with Dylan anyway. Over three and a half years or ten fights, you'd, you'd expect that to just evolve, and it has done. So, so you can be quite straight talking with each other and, and just say it how it is. And um, and and with that, I, you know, it's quite fluid and there's good dialogue. So if there's anything which happens, uh, we can jump on that really quickly. And because I have that good link with them, it, the key is to action, action quickly as well. Okay. So is there anything that you, you've had to work on particularly in this camp? I mean, you don't have to say if you don't want to say <laughs> any, anything particular. Well, I have, to, I have to admit, this camp has been great from that respect. I'm not just saying that because you're here. <laughs> Genuinely, it's... Um, you've, had, you've had a little bit less to do. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been great from that point. He's, he's just he's well within himself. He's, he's doing really well. Now, if we go back a few camps, certainly, certainly the earlier camps, uh, when he had, he had his shoulder operation after a fight in Joshua, certainly that was a bit more intensive and and certainly getting the rehab plans in place and really ensuring his work is right and he's doing the right exercises. So, um, but we have that relationship now where he knows where he stands on the injury and, and he'll flag it early. And, and that's actually another thing, because in the early, the early days, he just gets on with it. And he, whilst he knows we're here to help, he wouldn't necessarily say, he just, get, he just gets on with it. And um, over time, that's improved and he, you know, just, just, as I say, just having that good communication.
Yeah, I guess you you know his body probably as well as he does by now as well. Don't you? Which I was, well, funny enough, actually, it was the um, it was the Parker fight, and um, it was the morning of the fight. Which fight was this? The Parker fight. Oh, sorry, I just we got John Harding behind us hitting the hat, so I just <laughs> lost that in the uh, in the audience. No, it's fine. Yeah, no, it's the morning of the Parker fight, and um, this kind of kind of goes against slightly what I was just saying, but the reason why. So the morning of the Parker fight, he had his, he had his swollen. I walked into his room and he had his swollen hand. I was like, what's this? What's this? And he sort of pulled his hand back at the same time. So I oh, just, I just caught it in, on the jaw or something, you know. It, and I'm thinking, this, this isn't great. We're literally, you're literally fighting about three hours' time. And, um, and it's really, it wasn't just a bit swollen, it was really swollen. And um, anyway, the, obviously the fight went in head. He got the result. Yeah. Uh, and it was afterwards, I took him aside and said, you know, what, what was that about? What's, you know, why didn't you tell me? He said, I did it the week before. And I couldn't tell you, so I know what you'd say. <laughs> no. Yeah. So he went ahead with the fight, and obviously he clearly got the right result anyway. It, do you know? It's so interesting you say that because and, the morning after that fight, I was yeah. sat in the hotel yeah. opposite him having breakfast, and yeah. he had he was eating breakfast with his right hand, yeah. and he had his left hand in a bu bucket of ice. And that was me that gave was him that bucket you? of ice. No. Yes. <laughs> what a small world it is. What a small world it is. Exactly um, that. Exactly that. Fantastic. So. Fantastic. Um, it's been been great to sort of chat to yeah. you, get an insight yeah. to, to what you do in the part you play because I know. Having been here myself, I was lucky enough to, to kind of have the, the facilities and the guidance of people like yourself, and yeah. what a huge difference it, it can make to, to athletes. And I don't think boxers generally, uh, the, the guys in the GB setup as amateurs have an amazing kind of setup around them, but some boxers don't get that kind of guidance. And just, do you think without this, he would be uh, different to the boxer that we see today? Yeah, yeah I, I do, I do. Um, partly because it's just. It's the facility that's come here, it's, it's the coaching that comes with it, but also it's the education, and, and he's far more wise and aware about his body and what he should be doing, which he wasn't necessarily able to do beforehand. Uh, and education is, is key to, to pretty much everything. Good stuff. Simon, great to meet you. Thank Thanks you very much. All Cheers. Right. Cheers, thank you. I weren't too sure about this fight. It'll be announced soon, but, but I weren't too sure. But I'm glad he's got a bit more time to get ready for it. Yeah. But um, I've built his rounds up now, and he's, I told him how to relax and he get through the rounds. Because he can fight, he can box, but he wants to fight everyone. Yeah. And he's built for, he's built for yeah, rangy so stuff. Rangy. But you know what? He's half resilient. He's half resilient and tough, tough man. But you can't fight everyone short, especially strong men. No. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Got to use, he's skillful. He's got no leverage on the inside. Yeah, really. yeah, he's got, yeah. yeah. But, um, I like, I like John a lot. Really yeah, he's like a nice, John. they're all nice fellas, you know? And Richard, what about Richard? Richard, uh, he's fighting Billum Smith. Yeah, but is he, is he, is that, is he yours, like, he's yeah, yeah, yours? Yeah, 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 I train him all the time, but um, I've been up here, I, I had to get them all up here in the last, like, eight weeks, more or less, and uh, it was a bit difficult getting Duffield up here, but he loves it up here yeah, now, I can't get away. And then, when did you first bump into Dylan? How did you meet? Um, what happened was, what happened was with Dillian, we, we had the Andy Lee fight. We had the Andy Lee fight and um, he got the result, he won. He won well in good fashion, Billy Joe Saunders that was. Yeah. And then um, come back from uh, come back from Spain. It was after the AJ fight, wasn't it? You met him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had, he, after the AJ fight, yeah. He, as it happens, he brought back memories now. I was in Manchester for Billy Joe Saunders' world title fight a week before my dad and Billy was there. So, and then, but AJ and... Um, AJ and Dillian were fighting. Yeah. Yeah, with Dillian fighting. Yeah, I, yeah. I was in a hotel, I didn't have Sky there. I went out to the local town in uh, Manchester and it was all drunk and I went in the frame of mind. I, I feel like I'm fighting myself a week later, yeah, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, so I come back and I caught up with the news on the radio sort of thing with uh, Dillian's fighting him. I think a couple of months went on and um, one of the fighters which I was training at the time, I forget his name now, he was, uh, he went to me, Mark, um, Dillian White asked me for your number. So I said, yeah, give it to him. And, um, but a couple of years before that, I was looking at an heavyweight at the West Ham and I, I, I had a meeting with him and the board were coming to see if he could get a licence. But I was so busy, I was in the Peacock gym training as well, but yeah. I had a meeting with the board of control and it's heavyweight. But I couldn't get no heavyweights to move them around. But I spoke to a matchmaker I know and he, he, got, he got Dillian White over. And uh, Dillian over, sorry, Dillian over. And, uh, but you know what? I couldn't even make. I couldn't even make the. Uh, you know the board control. They do like a session to see if they can grant the man a license. Mm. I was just, my dad, dad, do me a favour. Can you uh, go to the West Ham? I said I'm, I'm busy at the Peacock with some boys that are fighting on a show. And I said Dylan White's going to be there. I want you to have a look at him. He's a good fighter. 
and because uh, I knew Dillian on the circuit sort of thing. And um, me dad was like, he was uh, busy doing whatever he was doing, and uh, but I rushed over to see him. As I rushed over to the West Ham, the ball of control, and I was already done their assessment on the heavyweight, and Dillian was walking out. And uh, I went, Dill, thanks for that. Thanks for what you did there, mate. You went, no problem. He just went up, went up the stairs at West at Plasto Station, got on a train and went back to Brixton. But I thought to myself, that was really, really good of him. That means to come over and yeah. he had time, he had time there. But then a couple of years later, that's when uh, I got in contact, or he got in contact with me, yeah. Because, I mean, we, we were talking earlier, the, the technical improvements he's made under you, it's harder for you to see as someone that sees no. every day that, that progress, but for someone who's kind of a back step from it, yeah. or rather a step back from it, should I say, it's very, very obvious the way you've sharpened him up and, and his shot selection, his balance, everything about the way he boxes under you. You've been a great combination. Have you, have you like, enjoyed working personally with him as well? Yeah. What's he like uh, to work with? It, it, you know, it's been cha- it has been challenging. You know, it has been challenging working with him, but when someone gives you your heart and soul and you can see potential in them, more than potential. And, uh, and we've trained on our own for, for, for a few years now, really on our own, up here. Mm. It, not in this, these sort of facilities. We had a we had a place around the corner, and uh, we've been through some. We've been through like I've learned about Dillian by being alone with him, and you know, and he's probably learned about himself. Yeah, really, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, um, you know, when you clip together, I understand. I understand his style. Yeah, I understand his art, his style. I know his heart. Uh, I knew he could be clever than he was, yeah? Like, um, and he needs to be clever. He mm. needs to be a bit more clever and uh, a bit more astute, so to speak, in his boxing, it, you know, and uh, not emotional and things like that. And he's getting experience now, it's all experience, and uh, you've got to go through certain things. And uh, But performance-wise, I've not really noticed it, but still want that, that old Dillian White. We've still got that in him, you know what I mean? We need that. but. He's got his elbows in, he's relaxed. He's, he's, a, he's like an old fashioned mm. box fighter, you know? And that's what he's got to do. But um, he's got a wonderful jab and I still ain't seen, he still ain't seen the best of it. He can jab from all angles and uh, he's got a rangy jab as well. And, uh, but he loves to have a fight. <laughs> he does, you, you've essentially had to turn a fighter into a boxer, I suppose, haven't you? Well, that's what, in my, my opinion, he needed, he needed a bit of a boxer, boxer about him. When he's moving up in levels, yeah. you've got to know how to box around certain people or box with them. And, or or, or be a, it's, it's certain times to be a fighter, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's certain times to be a boxer. And uh, it, it's just knowing, it's just, it's just it's knowing when to, to find the happy medium, so to speak, thing. Because that, that Joseph Parker fight, I mean, he was, he was ahead on the cards. Certainly you guys, I guess, must have thought you were ahead on the cards, but he went out in that 12th round as if he had to find the knockout. Mm. Gave us, from a fan's point of view, an amazing 12th round that we'll we'll still talk about today. But, I mean, that's got to have taken a year off your life as as a trainer, the way he approached that, because that's not not the kind of thing that you want from him. But I suppose, in that instance, he has to learn from that, right? And you have to to say, we can't have that kind of thing again. Well, well, see, Joseph Parker, I knew going into that fight that it was, it was our toughest fight to date because of mm. his boxing IQ, his snappiness. Mm. He, he was very well balanced, um, Joseph Parker, but I know how to upset that style, yeah? And I, I'm so passionate about it, I, I, can't, I can only ram it down his, his neck so many times, mm. what to do to upset that style. But I didn't want to say to Dillian, you're not, you're not a better boxer than him, because that's the worst thing you can say to him. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But, you know, I think he picked up on it and it, he tried to outbox him initially. And now you've got to rough him a little bit. Then the boxing, then the boxing will come into play. Different looks. You know what I mean, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that was a little bit of a lack of concentration in, in that last round. And yeah, but um, it was a good win for us, for sure. Yeah. Just talk to me about the, the changes in his body over the last, what, couple of years? Because you've worked with him since the Anthony Joshua fight, but of course he's had the benefit of the strength and conditioning, the nutrition, the physio, the expertise from, from a physiological point of view at yeah. Loughborough University. 
you obviously are taking more on the pads, you're feeling the power, the, the shot selection, the balance. Has all of that improved over, over the years? And just describe to me, if so, how it's improved. Well, what happens is, yeah, with Dillian's, with Dillian's, with Dillian being Dillian, yeah, you have to take him through certain, certain things and he has to find out himself. Do you know what I mean? But what he's got in his life right now, which I think he didn't have before, is structure. Yeah, his structure. And, and it's, it's good to stick to a structure. Every trainer has a system, yeah? You, you have to have a system. But according, according to performance, you, can, you have to tweak that, tweak that system from time to time, you know? So, so the strength and condition is at Loughborough University. They're doing a wonderful job, and you know, I've got to, got to know them personally now. They're doing a wonderful job, but it's nice to be around, just to go, oh, it's a little bit precarious, that, right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Getting near fight time. That's so how they're learning. They're only young guys, but they're going to be do they're, they're very intelligent people, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And they're good at, uh, they're very, very good at what they do. It, it certainly opened my eyes as well. But um, horses for courses, you know what yeah. I mean? You know, it works for Dillian, it works for Dillian. Yeah, good. All right, mate. Lovely to chat to you, Mark. Thanks, Chris. Good luck on Saturday, yeah? Good Thanks luck, my mate. Much. Thanks very much. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Thank you. So a few days later, uh, we come to London. Uh, last week, you had, I don't know, 15, 20 media interviews, and we missed you at the end. Um, you had to let the dogs out, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, of course, man. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, um, it's just an event. You know, I mean, I've got a life to live around it, so that life, obviously... Got other things, dogs, people, family and stuff, so. Do you find the demands of doing all the things you have to do in the build-up to fight week? Because presumably it's the time where you need to conserve as much energy as possible, but actually it's the time where you have to give so much to so many people, you have to answer so many questions, sort of things out. How do yeah, you find it? you know, it's part and parcel, it's your job, in it? You know what I mean? It's part of your job, so I just get it done, but then I try and get these guys to manage um, the, the, the amount of work I have to do and stuff because it's quite frustrating, you know what I mean, obviously. Because mm. you only keep everyone happy. You know? I felt bad after not doing interview with you guys, but also at the same time, you know, I think of myself and the dogs and other things as well. Of course, so, yeah. You know? No, no, listen, we're, we're all good and we're here, so, so it's no problem at all. So four days away now, fight mm. night of the O2, another headliner for you, another promise of a final eliminate from the WBC. I feel like this is Groundhog Day, like we've been here several times before. <laughs> How does it feel from your point of view? I don't care about the WBC, what they do, man. I just focus on me. It's a big fight, you know. Um, I just try to make sure that I'm fully focused and fully trained and fully switched on, man. You know, I started as trainer, I just think, you know what? Whatever they do, whatever they do, my team and the year and that, they deal with that, man. I just focus on... Because it's very easy to... Focusing this, focusing that, focusing mm. and then your mind is not where it's supposed to be. Yeah. So I just make sure my mind is exactly where it's supposed to be, whatever else happened, happened. One of the, the hallmarks of great fighters from the 50s, 60s, 70s was the regularity with which they fought. And the yeah. average for the 50s, 60s was like six times a year, and it's slowly gone down to a point where we're at the, the biggest heavyweight fighters fight once, twice a year. You fought 10 times in the last three years. Is boxing regularly something that you try and do, and is it important to you? Yeah, I'm some, you know, it's funny, I'm not the, one of the top guys in the game, but I'm like, my experience level is way, way down. This guy been boxing for 20 years, 25 years. I've been boxing for 11 years. Mm. So, and I had seven amateur fights. Like, this guy I'm boxing at over 200 amateur fights. <laughs> you know, he's a 26 professional fighter, 26 professional fights. So, I just try and box as much as I can, try and get as much experience as I can. More camp, more training, you know. I try and throw the same punch over and over and over until I master it, mm. man. So I just, it's good for me to be busy and keep chipping away and just keep on it, learning and improving as well, you know. I feel like you're learning and improving. So much of it's happened in the last three years because you've changed so much around you in terms yeah. of support. Um, at what point did you look at yourself, your career, the structure around you and say, I need to up my game, What I need to make changes. When I got beaten by Joshua, you know, I look at what he was doing and what I was doing and what it was like different between day and night, you know, I was training by myself, eating whatever my mum made, whatever I was at home, living life, cracking on, training through pain, injuries and stuff, which eventually broke me down in the end anyway, which eventually led to, to, to massive injuries and stuff that I had to surgery two days after the fight and stuff like that, my shoulder, um, my shoulder shut up, my shoulder joint shut up in the second round of the fight and stuff because I was in the wrong training. I never saw a physio once up until that point. I didn't even get a massage or anything. I was just training and just living life. I never dieted. I never thought, oh, you know, eat this, eat that. I just thought, oh, yeah, this is what I grew up on. This, this is good enough. I grew up on eating, um, 
Caribbean food, it, 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 and they think it's the best food in the world, you yeah. know. It's good food, Tastes don't good, get me wrong, yeah. it's great <laughs> food, it's great food, very nutritious as well, but but as a compete as a competing road level athlete, you need to be more scientific and change certain things. Mm. Realize there's better nutrients in other things, you know, the amount you need to eat. So we look at we broke it down and so you know what? We need to change this. And then that led me to Loughborough University, man. Because mm. in professional sport, in any sort of team sport or racket sport, the top people have access to like national funding, they'll have a, a national training base, they'll have physio, they'll have strength and conditioning coaches, they'll have people to advise them on all of these different areas. And that's set up, you walk into that system and it's like you're back to school. For a boxer, even if you're at the top level, as you are, you have to set that structure up. So how do you go uh, about... How if you, you come to the GB, and, the GB squad, you have that set up. In the amateurs, yeah. But yeah. as a pro, it's very, there's very few that, that have access to the, the kind well, of Well, most of the guys that come through the GBs, when they turn pro, they remain there anyway. Yeah, that's true, yeah. You know, that's how Joshua has been. He's remained there his whole career. Mm. You know what I mean? So he had that set up. And that's where he had to jump on me because he's been doing that for 11, 12 years. And I've been doing it for, you know, I just started doing it basically, you know what I mean? So he already had to jump on me in, 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 in performance, science, knowledge, mm. know-how, proper training and everything, but I still almost um I still almost got the job done but because there's more to fighting than all of this stuff, you know what I mean? You you have natural fighters who present who possess certain natural talents, you have know, guys who are warriors, you know, thank God um, you know, I have produced a lot of them qualities and now we're just trying to mellow it out, train, do all add all the little bits and pieces, man. You talk about being a natural fighter. Mark I was talking to Mark uh, last week and he said, you know, he the, the things you've worked on and you can see it just as a fan you can see the way that you've technically sharpened up your game your shot selection the way you think about mm. the, the fight the IQ everything's gone up as a result of the work you've done with Mark yeah. in, in the gym but the one thing he said that he didn't want you to lose was the, the natural dog that's in you the natural fighter that's in you do you think it's important to find a balance between the two that would never go I, anyone that knows me knows um, there's more chance of um, <laughs> you know that would never go yeah that's just me as a person. That's my genetic makeup. It's what I've done. It's all survival and it's all I'm still alive and being in this position where I am now. So I never worry about that. I like to worry. Rudy Mark said, I like to worry about the technical stuff, the more finesse stuff to learn it because that's my weak area. Yeah. You know, why am I going to work in my strong area? Mm. You know, I try to work in my weak area. So a lot of people worry about me losing that, whatever. I'm like, listen, you don't need to worry about that. Whenever time it's time to throw down, I'll throw down, you know. But do you ever look back, I mean, like the Parker fight, 12th round, for example, where you're up on the cards, you go into that round, but you fought like you were nine rounds down needing a knockout. And then obviously it was a, it was a mad round. Amazing for the fans. But do you feel, looking back on that, it might have been better to play that little safer? I would never be that guy. Yeah. You know, we're not going there trying to entertain, they're trying to get the job done. You know, um, sometimes obviously you try and pick up a winner or whatever, but... I don't feel comfortable doing that, you know. I want to try and win every round, every second, every minute. I want to try and create as much, um, you know, as bad as it sounds, I want to create, and create as much physical and mental damage as I can mm. while I'm in there, you know. Um, you know, obviously, I'm not like that every day, but, you know, once I get in there, I just think, you know what, you know, it is what it is. I want to get hold of this man and, and, and try and, and rip him to pieces if I can. You know, and that's my mindset. I don't think, oh, I'm 12 run up, I'm gonna start messing about. No, let's 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 go till the bells finish. Sometimes a little bit after the bells finish, but you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's all right though, that's all right. You you get you get a free pass. Um do you rely on Mark then in between rounds if he feels like he needs to rein you in a little bit and just remind you to get back to what it is you're supposed to be doing. Is is that the point? Those those minute, those sixty seconds in between a round where you and him you listen to what he says, and if he says, listen, you can't we, down. we have a good relationship, you know what I mean? Um, Mark doesn't need to say much to me, to be honest. I just know what he wants me to do, and he knows where I'm at, what I'm doing, and stuff like that. And I just automatically knows in my head, it's like, okay, I'm in this position, Mark mm. would want this, or Mark would want me to up the output. He just reminds me sometimes that, oh, deal, you know, keep this going, keep that going. I've already said that, I just need little reminders here and there, but. I know my coach, he knows me, he knows what I'm like, and I know what he's like, and I know that, okay, when I'm, in, when I'm doing this, the guy's saying, Mark wants this, or he wants me to do this. I just know, I just know you have a relationship with your coach. Mm. You know, we've had 10 fights now coming up, so we know each other now. It's mad how many fights you've had since that Joshua 
Yeah, yeah, you know, it's been a long road, man. Been a long road, you know, it's been a long, just through it. Everyone has been professional at the same time as me, or just after me, fought for a road title two or three times, mm. you know, apart from me. You know, some won, some lost, but they still fought for. Look at Brazil, he's had two road title shot, mm. and he's just lost both of them for two different governing bodies, you know. Parker, yeah. you know, Andy Ruiz, all of these guys, you know. You were sitting there just now listening to Teddy Atlas comments about how long you've been waiting, how long we've all been waiting mm. for you to have a world title shot. Um, also, the, the kind of general consensus is that never has a fighter been kept from a title cha a, a champion longer than you've never been kept from Deontay Wilder. Of, never in the history of sports Why? in general, not just in boxing. I don't know, you know, I, I'm not one to sit here and say, oh yeah, because I'm dangerous, because I'm this. I don't claim to be the best fighter, the most dangerous fighter, the most strongest fighter, but Deontay Wilder sees something in me that he knows that, you know what, this guy could potentially be a massive problem. And that's, obviously, you know, it's my courage and my heart, my desire and my hunger, my, dis my discipline as well, which is becoming a thing, which is a new thing. That's, you know, my discipline. And these guys have seen, they've seen or I've lost or a comeback or a change. They've seen me, you know, they've seen that I'm tough. They've seen me get knocked down in the last round and still get up and so then my thing. They've seen me press twice. They've seen me come from behind. They've seen me get knocked out and get back up, you know what I mean? They've they, they seen a, a, re, a re, risen again from the acid and stuff. They've seen, you know, they see there's a burning desire in me that I don't go away easy. I'm not easily put put down. I'm not easily discouraged, you know what I mean? So, so you know, so, and as far as you can see that, you know, mm. that's like one of those fights where you think, oh, you know what? That's like um, when certain fighters do certain things, I will give them credit because I'm like, you know what? I don't like you, but that was good. That was that was excellent. That's like if the combo just to put Andrew Ruiz down with. Right? I was like, oh, I, was, I was like, yeah, that's that's some sick combo the way he done it, mm. you know. But then Ruiz came back and beat him, so you know I gave Ruiz a lot of credit for that, you know, because he went in as an adult to the fight and shot Norris and done it. Fury getting up from Deontay Wilder's knocked down in the twelfth round, you know, I admire all those things. So I give these guys credit for those things openly, you know. Just want your shot. Yeah, but let's let's see what happens, man. You know. I, I I can't, I've learned, you know, you can't focus on these things, but you have to just keep cracking mm -hmm. on, man. Otherwise, I wouldn't be fighting. I wouldn't be giving my fans a fight. I would just be waiting, 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 waiting. I'd have fight, and nobody's like what some of these guys do, you know? I didn't have to fight Oscar Rivers. Oscar Rivers is the kind of guy you fight only if you're mandatory to fight him. I, if he's managed to fight you for a title or for a royal title, you don't fight these kind of guys. I could have fought. Look, look at Fury, he just fought Tom Schwartz and I could have fought that similar opponent, find mm. some garbage guy with an undefeated record and just say, yeah, this guy's good, he's undefeated. Sure, knocking out some guys and just fight someone like that. No one would complain about that. Speaking of Fury, I, I saw you, first time I ever saw you fight live was um, at Blue Water, Mick Hennessy's mm. build, do you remember? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I remember. So what was, I, I guess, what, seven, eight years ago, maybe, like something like that? I don't know. I don't know. I'm getting on a bit. But I? you had DeGale was there, Eubank was boxing that night as well, mm -hmm. um, and I think Fury's, one of his family members, I think Phil Fury was there, Fury, Tyson was there. So Tyson has seen the work you've had to put in and how hard your route has been, and he's seen you go up through the levels. Knowing that you've crossed paths a number of times, knowing he knows how hard you work to get to the position I've been in camp in. with him. I've lived in a traveller site with him for, I think, two months, I think it was. Lived in a site with them, stayed in the same place with them, ate in the same place with them. He knows me well. I've been in many camps with him. So why do you think he takes seemingly so much kind of pleasure in, you know, coming out and saying, I'm going to be the one to block your, your shot at Deontay Wilder because me and... Um, Wild have got these two fights lined up. What, what does that make you feel when you hear him say things like that and Fury take kind just of glee? Talk in it? Shit, it's just a media whore, you know. He says whatever he thinks people want. You know what Fury's good at doing? Conning the public. He's very, very good at rallying the public to his side, using the, the sympathy act and, and saying stuff like, oh, yeah, you know, mental health. Um, when I fight the Enter Wild, I'm going to give all my money to charity and stuff like that. Amazingly, this charity has never surfaced, so there's no evidence of him doing all of this, you know what I mean? Um, he says give his all process. You know, this guy just talks nonsense, but, you know, the boxing media and the fans will give him the platform to do stuff like that, you know. He starts rubbish. One minute he was saying good stuff about me. Ah, oh, Dillian's done well. He's done this. The WBC's taking the piss. She's giving the tap there. Now he's saying that. Same with Joshua. When Joshua lost, oh, you know, the fellow Brit British guy, um, 
he will come back and then the next minute he's saying, oh, just it's garbage, he's just... Mm. That's if he really just talks nonsense the whole time. He, don't get me wrong, he's a good fighter, he's a big guy, awkward guy, good fight, but he just talks nonsense the whole time. It's just, he just... It's very difficult to understand what he's trying to gain or... Like, you know, he was happy Joshua lost. I'm like, why would he be happy he lost? That's your biggest payday in boxing right there, mm. gone. Mm. This just make no business sense. Mm. It makes it makes no sense whatsoever. These guys are just stupid. You know, these guys are so stupid. Why would he be happy that one of the biggest cash cow, one of the biggest fighters in the game, lost? You should you should be sad because you should be one, the one that wanna beat him unless you're scared to fight him. Did you have any regrets when Joshua lost, of thinking course. it could have been you? No, no, I didn't regret. Because it wasn't me, I just regret because I took his O as an amateur. He took my O as a professional. I wanted to be the one to take his O again as a professional. Mm. You know, that's why that was my only regret. Mm. With um with theory and, and the the narrative of mental health and his comeback journey and everything, I think often what he actually did wrong in those two years gets lost in the fact that he was, you know, suffering with mental health difficulties as he says he was. And I've no doubt that there were elements of that. Mm -hmm. But I think perhaps what what you're saying is that the public maybe wouldn't have gone as easy on him if he hadn't talked about his problems with mental health. Because you got to, you can't forget kind of homophobic slurs, misogynistic slurs, the fact that he was banned from Andrew uh, for two uh, years, uh, cocaine. I'm never, I'm never commenting on this because I know I'll get a lot of sticker. Yeah. Listen. But those are, those are just them. facts, as in the comments he made, the, the, the Nandrolone that he was, found, he, he was I know, banned but for. I, I'm neither judge nor jurist. If he yeah. made homophobic comments and he was banned for steroids and and cocaine and that. That's nothing to do with no. me. No, that's, that's nothing to do with you. What, that, that, you well, what I'm asking you is, I'm, I'm asking you, do you think the public have gone easier on him because of this this kind of mental health narrative that they forget a lot of the things happening in those two years? I mean, he's great at covering up and rallying there. Because what smart, what a smart man he is. To, to wash that all on the carpet, just say, yeah, I was depressed, I was going to kill myself, I was drinking... That's a great, that's great. That's the, who still does his publicity for him or who still advise him, they're great. That because that, that's one way of um, just, you know, people people will forget everything, you know. Mm. They'll forget everything. You can start because it's a serious issue. It's not an issue to be joked with. It's not an issue to 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 use as an advantage, you know. Mental health is a serious thing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, you know it, 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 there's people that are really suffering and if you're low enough to use that, uh, um, then, you know, I, I can't say because I don't know. What he was doing and what was going on in his life, but you know, I, I, you know, I would never do something like that. As a man, you feel like if you do something wrong, there's certain things you have to take responsibility for yourself and not just always make excuses. All the time. I always hold my hands up to what I do wrong, man. You know, I'm, mm. you know, I'm not perfect. I've done a few wrongs here and there, but I just try my best. I try to help people. I just try and do my thing. With me, what you see is what you get. I'm not a guy that will will say one thing behind your back and say another thing in your face or. I'm not a guy who will pretend to be something I'm not. I am what I am. Mm. That's probably one of the reasons why I'm not where I should be. I, w I got to where I want to get to yet because people see that, you know, this guy is not going to shut up. He's not going to take money to be paid off or whatever. This guy's going to say what he wants and what he feels, you know, because that's what, that's, what, that's what my father teach me. That's what I know to do. You know, I don't know to be anything else, man. It's been the public of change towards you in the last three years because when you first came on the scene and to fight Joshua you were like kind of painted as the bad guy and you were like the he was the hero you the mm -hmm. anti-hero but do you feel now like people have come around to you and they've accepted you for what you, you are know, people is understanding and seeing more now because at that point I was a nobody yeah who know who Dylan, Dylan White was no one no one ever knew who it was I actually did to be fair but yeah, but you know, you, you, you're an hardcore boxing <laughs> yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're someone who have an interest in yeah. probably watch amateur fights, watch unlicensed fights, watch mm -hmm. So you know, no one knew who I was. Mm. At that point, I didn't care what they made me out to be or they made me. I just need to arrive. And once I arrived, then I started working and showing people what I am, what I'm about, what I do. I started um, shining a bit of my light and my upbringing and other things like that. You know, I didn't. That's what I mean, that's gonna present my I didn't think, oh, I could use a sympathy story, um, you know, tough upbringing in Jamaica, shot, stabbed, this, that, and the other. I could have used all of that, but that's that's not my that's only came up because of people in my team tried to, you know, say, oh, you need to share a bit of light in your story. This, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, hear me going around crying about these things, you know what I mean? Crying about the tough life I've had growing up in South being a, a Jamaican kid that come here. Didn't go to school, couldn't speak English properly, and I don't, I don't, you know, that's not, I don't like to, I don't like 
draw it in sympathy, man. Mm. It's like, you know, I just don't want a fair crack at the whip, man. That's yeah. all, you know. Do, do you feel like, obviously, you've now in a, you're now in a position where you can provide opportunities for guys in the way that you maybe didn't have opportunities when you were up and coming? No one helps me. But these guys, they're talented fighters. I see these guys. I know what it's like to be on the bottom and trying to get your career off and nothing can happen. You're a good fighter, but then you're training, then you have to go to work. Or you're training, you're, you're talented, you're, you're hanging in there with the good guys and then you're not getting no opportunities. I know when they're hoping, you know what it's like. So for me, I've been through the mill. Thank God I'm doing okay and things is planning up for me. So I think, you know what? A lot of these guys, they'll tell you, I don't even chase them down for management fee and stuff like that. I just help them get them opportunities and, and try and say to them, listen, um, I'll, I said to these guys, listen, I'll help you get some advantage. Even this new guy I just signed, Alan Babbage. Mm. He just said to me, you know, I can't believe 10 days ago, I was a doorman. I'm a top amateur, top MMA fight in my country. People would even spit on me. You know, that's what he said to me. But he came over, he spotted me and I liked the guy, you know. He was telling me, and I liked the guy. I said, you know what? Let's get your lesson. And he's had, he's going to have two fights in the space of two weeks. Wow. He can't believe it, you know. He's, he's, he's knocking about. But that's just, I'm just trying to help people, man, you know. It doesn't cost me anything to help people, you know what I mean? I just try my best to, to try and help people and, and bring them on because no one helped me. I know what it's like to want to give up boxing. Yeah, yeah. At what point did you want to give up? Many times, man. It's been hard, man. It's been hard, you know. Even now, I'm one of the top guys in the game. I'm still getting um, fought. I'm still, they're still trying to keep me down. I'm still getting fought left, right and centre, you know. They're still giving me... Like, the driving bullets making me jump through hoops, having hard fights after hard fights. So yeah, yeah. It's like there's someone's trying to hope I'm going to slip up and lose to one of these guys mm. so they can get rid of me, you know? Then to a while, I said, oh, sign a PBC. Oh, fight this guy. Oh, I'm going to make you wait two years. Oh, the WBC seen this and they know about this and they let it go on. And they got, the IBF yeah. took me at the ranking because I'm WBC silver champion. They claim me as a world champion. Mm. It doesn't make no sense. You know, WBO giving Usyk the mandatory. That one is not so bad because that's always been in, it's the, in the rules, rules. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But, but still, at least let him have one heavyweight fight mm. first, you know what I mean? You know, they, but it is what it is, life goes on, you know, you don't crave a spilt milk, you mop it up. And you're still getting headliners, you're still getting paid and people, and your, your uh, profile's uh, always going to be uh, high. Uh, I'm trying, man. I'm trying. I'm just trying to, you know, I'm trying to not rob the fans. I'm trying to give the fans a good main event, but also a great undercard as well. Yeah, yeah. If you look at all my last few fights, the undercards, every undercard that I've had a saying, Cost me a hell of a lot of money because these guys ain't cheap. These guys, are, yeah. these guys are expensive. These guys are well. If I'm fighting a 50-50 fight, I want this, and I understand. But I just pay it because I want the fans to come out and say, you know what? I went and watched still and it was in a great fight. But the undercard, wow! From fight number one to the main event, it was all a great, memorable fights. You yeah. know, and that's one thing that's big for me. Look at a lot of these fights. Look at the Ante Wilder fight the other day, main event. Who was on the undercard? Yeah, Just the fact there is main event. Only fight you probably can remember is the Katie Taylor one, really. Mm -hmm. You know, and Justice one. You know, look before that, you know, these guys, they all do it, you know. Yeah, right. But I, I try and keep that, you know, that's one thing I'm measuring, keep my whole career, good fights in the end of cards, you know. Bringing up people with you. Yeah, yeah, no, of course, because, you know, listen, it's hard times. For someone to spend 40 or 60 or 100 or 200 pounds or whatever it is on a ticket, that's a lot of money for people. You know, that's, the, that's a lot of, uh, so, so you want people to feel value, you know, come and say, you know what, that was worth it, I look forward to the next fight. And it feels like Team White Fight Night, React Poor and Harding and, and everyone else, Charlie Duffield, all on the bill. It feels like you all train together, be in the same camp and build towards the same fight night. That must be a good feeling. Yeah, you know, um, there's, we train get other fighters in as well, but it's the availability. Yeah. When the guys in camp, I know they're available. I know, see, I don't mind saying, oh, I'll put Richard in at four weeks notice or this, because I know what he's been doing. I see him, he's been up in camp with me. I know that's like um, Duffield, all these guys. Mm. You know, that's like Duffield's fighting Dennis Seeds. Dennis Seeds is a friend of mine. I picked Duffield to win because I know what Duffield's been doing. I've seen it. So, you know, I'm just like, okay, there's no problem letting him go because he's been working. But if they're training and doing their own thing, I don't know. So I'd be like, well, I, I can't really, you know, so I keep in contact with all of them, you know. You know, Fabio is busy, you know, I mean, he's a great talent. I think, um, in the next few years, he's going to really shine through, you know. Richard's the man at the minute as well. You know, right now, he just, 
knocking everyone out, you know, kind of British DNT. Why not? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He's better looking though. Um, well, that's your opinion. Eh? <laughs> I don't know what guy is better looking to the other guy. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. He's your mates. So you should say yes anyway. Hey, um, I if know... it was a girl, I'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you went to Daniel Dubois' pro debut. Um, you were, yeah, yeah, you were, yeah, I'll yeah. show you this video of you going and saying hello to him yeah, backstage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's come a long way. No, he's good. Listen, you have to keep an eye on what's there and who's there, <laughs> yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Because I know Daniel Dubois for long before he turned professional. I know him from when he was a kid. You know, I know him from the kids days he bring him to the gym, but it's just good to be cool and respectful to people, you know. It's, it costs nothing because you don't know who that kid's going to be. You can be nice as this person and tomorrow he's, the, he's your local bank manager. Mm. You know, or, you know, you never know what kid's going to be, you know. People don't stay young forever. So give people respect and give people time. And there's someone I know for a while, so as he grew up, I was like, you know what? I remember this kid when he's young, he's a bloody giant. Now I'll go and see how well he's come on, you know. And that's what I just went and watched. And also one of um, Mark's fighters was on as well. Um, so I went, I went and watched it, it's a double for me. Yeah. Okay, we're going to do Dylan White's 32 second challenge with 32 reds. Miguel's boxing gym. Great for the youth. Uh, Sonny Liston. Hell of a beast. <laughs> uh, kickboxing. Brutal, but very disciplined sport. Okay. Um, first Anthony Joshua fight. War. We just went to war. The second fight was war as well. We just went to war. Um, potential third Anthony Joshua fight? Be the same thing again. Just an hour at war. Till someone get knocked out, you know, it won't be. Me and Joshua is never going to have a technical boxing fight. It doesn't matter how hard we train, what we do. Even if we're 60, we're still going to have a brawl. Mm. To one of our hips to give up. <laughs> uh, best fight city in the world. <sighs> tough, aren't they? It's tough. I'm British. Of course, I'm, I'm British and I'm London. Of course, I'm going to say London, but good answer. best fight city is probably going to be Vegas, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty good you answer. Know, if you're a real person. Yeah. But... Nothing beats London. Your call is a great um, venue. There you go. Best vet fight. Your call's quality, yeah. Yeah. Before days time, the O2, that's yeah, home. Yeah, yeah. Uh, James Tony. Enigma. Tyson Fury, the boxer. Good boxer. Tyson Fury, the man. Piece of shit. Derek Chisora. That boy is all right. Our beef is over. Says <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah. Our beef is over. Says yeah. all right. He's all right now. You know, Derek's all right. Yeah. Ask me that question. Eight months ago, we well, have a yeah, different yeah. answer. Yeah. Uh, Loughborough. Um, great place, you know, full of um, smart, intelligent people, man. Mm. And finally, the body snatcher. I am who I am. You are who you are. Mm. Dylan White, thank you for coming on TK. Respect, Pleasure man. to speak to you. Cheers. Thank you very much. Uh, another episode of the show done and dusted. Big thanks to Dylan White and good luck to him on Saturday night at the O2 Live on Sky Sports. Check it out. Um, and we'll see you again in seven days' time. You've been watching TKO on Joe, together with 32 Red.